Good morning, ladies. Uh, welcome this morning again. Uh, today we're going to be learning through Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to deal with the last few verses, uh, verses 16 to 23. Um, it's such a privilege, actually, to study the Word of the Lord. I was speaking with someone on Sunday who has had it laid on his heart um, to reach out to the Somalians with the gospel. Um, and he was telling me that in Somalia, it's illegal to preach the gospel. Um, it's illegal to be a Christian. You will get executed. You will. Um, and so <clears throat> if you are one or become one there, they will kill you. You will die for your faith. And so as a result, um, there is absolutely no ways at all possible for the gospel to be preached in Somalia. But it so turns out and this young man is just incredibly inspiring to me because he was saying, you know, um, if we can't get the gospel to them, the Lord has been so good to them. Did you know that there is a um, contingent of Somalians that live in Polokwane and that we could reach out to them? <laughs> um, and I think that's incredible. I, I, um, he, his heart is so for reaching out to those people with the Lord that if we can't go there, if the Lord's not going to send me there, he's brought them here. And we have access to the word, and it's not illegal. Um, and so that's what I was thinking. Here we are sitting with our Bibles comfortably before us, and we're freely able to worship, and we're freely able to be Christian without the reality of execution um, that others face, not just Somalians, but many others in different countries around the world. And so, <coughs> excuse me, with that in mind, I really want to exhort you today to take seriously the precious gift of faith that we've been given we need to take it seriously, and we need to take seriously the Lord. All right, let us pray. Father, we are so thankful for this day. Lord, I'm always reminded every morning that your mercies are new, and I really love that psalm that says that we can praise you for your steadfastness in the morning and your faithfulness at night. Um, and so, Lord, with the privilege that you've given us today to gather together and um, to learn through your word i ask that you would bless this time i ask that you would give me clarity of thought and that you would open up our hearts and our minds and that you would cause your word to sink very deep in us and that with the aid of the holy spirit you would transform us into the image of your son amen so as we learned in the previous lesson paul was exhorting and warning the church at colossae to not let anyone delude them with plausible arguments that present an addition or an alternative to the complete deity and supremacy of Christ for our salvation, okay? Um, the, that idealism, if we want to call it that, is called ecumenicism or ecumenity. And under false pretenses and empty deceits, encourages Christians to embrace all manners of religion um, to get salvation. <coughs> This is a lie. It's a lie. Christ plus nothing equals everything. And as a quick reminder, let us quickly read again about our Savior from Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 to 15. I have it here before me, so I'll read it straight. It says, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame <coughs> by triumphing over them in him. So now we're into our text for this week. Uh, let's read the first two verses there, uh, verse 16 and 17, where we continue from last week. It says, so therefore, now that you know this about Christ, okay, what we've just read. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink and drink or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. 
These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So the first truth that we need to observe here is that because of the work and person of Jesus Christ our Lord, we are free. We're free. We don't have to adhere any more to those human precepts and regulations. We are free. We're made free in Christ. We have been freed from the slavery of the flesh, which adheres to and desires worldly rules and regulations. Because we do. We like rules. We say we don't what we do, because if we can achieve those rules or complete them, then we feel good about ourselves. So that is a fleshly thing, right? When the passage here says, let no one pass judgment on you, it's not saying, don't let people judge you, okay? That's not what it means. People are going to judge you no matter what. It's going to happen whether you like it or not. Let's go back to the context of the passage, okay? It says, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink. So, what it is saying is that these judgments and decisions that people are going to pass on you are meaningless. Don't let it affect you, okay? Here is an example. If someone says to you, well, um, eating pork disqualifies you as a Christian, okay? Or uh, another one that I've heard before, if you eat rare meat, um, I know some people like their steak so rare, I think it's called blue, and I think it basically means that sometimes there's a bit of a bloody type of juice that comes out of it. Personally, that's not my favorite, but they'll be like, yeah, in Leviticus, it says X, Y, Z, and you know, they weren't allowed to eat pork, and you were not allowed to eat any flesh with the blood in it, so on and so forth. Okay, if somebody says stuff like that to you, okay, and here you are trying to enjoy your blue steak or your pork, you can say to them, you can firstly, with a clear conscience, disregard what they're saying, okay? Because if we know the word of God, we know that none of those rules and restrictions save you. Here's the key. This is what Colossians is talking about. People are now worried about their salvation, okay? Thinking that Christ's death on the cross was not enough to save them. Ooh, so I better still adhere to these Old Testament rules if I want to maintain my salvation or, you know, it's nonsense. Rules and regulations don't save you. They don't keep you saved either. Okay, here's what we do know. None of them make you righteous. That's another thing. The rules don't add to your righteousness and they don't take away your righteousness and they don't make you righteous if you were not righteous. Only Christ does that. Here's the truth about those regulations. They were given to the Israelites by God at the time to set them apart from other nations so that they would be external. It's an external evidence that they are different to the other people around where they were living. Along with that, there were health reasons, you know. And so again, I'm going to say to you, if you are a person who for health reasons is unable to eat something or unwilling to eat something, go for it. But the moment you're going to think that your dietary restriction has got anything to do with your salvation and your righteousness, you are wrong. Okay. So, those rules were only ever given to the Israelites to set them apart as an actual physical evidence. Set apart not because they were holy. It had nothing to do with them as a nation. It had to do with, I need people to see you from the outside that you are different. So here are some rules. Okay. I want us to quickly look at some scripture references because it's very helpful. It's very encouraging. I was in a conversation with a friend yesterday who was talking about how amazing it is that God's word throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, because God is one and he's unchanging and it is his actual word, this is wonderful to know different scriptures because then you can, if ever you're in an opportunity speaking with somebody who has got these wrong ideas, you can have some other scripture references that can affirm what the Lord says every time. So Matthew 15 verse 11, it says, Christ is saying to his disciples, hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. Okay? Because we know that scripture, what the heart is full of, the mouth overflows. Okay. Here's another one. Mark chapter 7, verse 14 and 15. He is recording the same event. He says, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. Okay? Here's another scripture. 
Acts, verse, or Acts chapter 10, verse 9 to 16. It tells of this. It says, The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. So, God does not contradict himself. He doesn't lie, and he doesn't change his mind either. There is word straight out of the mouth of the Lord. What God has made clean, do not call common. Remember last week we spoke about that scripture, and now I'm going to grossly not be able to quote it, where it's, if you do not eat from faith, um, it is sin. Yeah, anyway, everything that God has made is good is the point. So, I want us to, to just quickly stay here for a moment on freedom. Yes, we're free in Christ, okay? That's absolutely, there's no question about it. But freedom in Christ does not mean that we are at liberty to live as we please, to the degree that in practicing this freedom, we can cause others to stumble, okay? You are not at liberty to exercise your freedom to the expense of somebody else, at the expense of somebody else, okay? Um, here's an example. Even though I am at liberty to drink wine, this is a touchy subject, if I know that a brother or a sister in Christ struggles with this idea, okay, or if I know that there is an unbeliever there who has a concept that, or, or an idea in their mind that Christians are people who um, are complete teetotalers and don't touch any alcohol, then it is for the sake of those believers, for the sake of this unbeliever, and for the testimony of Christ that I abstain from drinking wine. You know, Scripture talks about considering others as more important than ourselves, okay? And so, in that moment, to be able to hold back from practicing my freedom, I am not being a stumbling block to that person. Pastor Charlie preached on Sunday about being a stumbling block. You do not want to be a stumbling block to one of the Lord's chosen. Be careful. And we as Christians can do that. Okay. And so... If, um, if I insist on practicing that freedom, I run the risk of being a stumbling block and causing them to stumble in their walk. And we know that the Lord is very serious about this. And further to that, further to us uh, being stumbling blocks, um, when I abstain, when we abstain from practicing our freedom, I also want you to realize that it doesn't add to your righteousness and it doesn't take away from it either. You're now not being more righteous because, oh, I know that Anne has a problem with chocolate. And so how amazing am I that every time we're at a party, I don't put chocolate there because I know Anne struggles. Look how righteous I am. That's nonsense. Okay. It's nonsense. Your freedom, abstaining from it, using it, it doesn't save you and it doesn't make you any less or more righteous. Okay. So... God's word says, way better than me. Sorry, my mind is a little bit all over the show. What I was trying to explain, God's word says it better than me in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8 and 9. I love this verse, these verses. It says, food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. There we go. I should have just read that. <laughs> All right. The second truth we need to observe is that because of the work and the person of Jesus Christ our Lord, festivals, new moons, Sabbaths, rituals, or any other legalistic practice is empty and meaningless. Doing them does not make us righteous, nor do they save us, nor do they make us right before God. Okay, that is what the verse is saying. Let's go back. Let's, let's read it there. It says, 
Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So, why do they not make us righteous when we practice them? Why do they not make us right before God? Why do they not save us? Because they were only ever a shadow of the things to come. This is interesting. I love how MacArthur explains this. He says, a shadow has no reality. Now, I like this because I'm an artist, so shading and shadows are one of the things that we have to deal with in art, okay? The shadow itself has no reality. It's, what is it? It's a combination of light and the absence of light. It's, it's got nothing. It's got no substance, okay? The reality is what makes the shadow. So I'm going to need a tree for a shadow to be cast by the light. I'm going to need an actual thing. So... What is our reality? Christ is our reality. He's the one of which all these shadows, he's the substance of which all these shadows are. So all the rituals, the new moons, the festivals, the Sabbaths, the everything that sets us apart as such are meaningless in and of themselves. They are the shadow. We now have Christ. He is the substance. He is the reality. Okay. Um, Jesus Christ is is the reality to which all of those shadows point, okay? So, continuing in the preoccupation with the shadows, once you've got the reality, is pointless. If I'm going to sit here, let's use my tree analogy, and be like, oh my gosh, it's a shadow of a tree. Look at all the shadowy leaves. And the tree's like, uh, I mean, you could, I'm right here, if you like. Uh, you, you can touch me. <gasps> but the shadow, come on, it's foolishness, okay? Here is Paul's point. True spirituality, our true spirituality does not consist merely of keeping external rules because that's what these Sabbaths and rituals and those kinds of things are when we observe these certain practices. They are external rules, okay? True spirituality comes from having an inner relationship with Jesus Christ. Isaiah Chapter 1, verse 11 to 15. This is from the Lord. It says, What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I've had enough of burnt offerings, of rams, and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls, or of lambs, or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings, Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations, I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. I think God is pretty clear. He is not interested in your external practices. He is not interested because he sees our hearts. So you stand there and you do your things. Let's actually use modern day. Let me tell you something. If you are not a believer, if you are not saved, and you are taking communion because you are fearful of what the other people in church are going to think, let me tell you something, you are heaping, you are heaping judgment on yourself. This is a very, very serious thing. God takes it very seriously. He does not want your empty praise. He does not want your empty external worship. He doesn't want lip service, okay? He wants your heart. Hosea chapter 6 verse 6, God says, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Psalm 51 verse 17 says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. He will not despise a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. That's what God wants. He wants your broken and contrite heart, broken over your sin, contrite over your sin, not sad and crying and depressed, 
broken over, hating what God hates. Okay? Can you see then that God does not change? He's never accepted ritual and sacrifice. God is interested in your heart, whether you love him or not. Do you love his son? Do you believe him? Do you believe God that his son is your righteousness? Do you believe him that only Christ's death on the cross earns you your salvation? He is not interested in anything else you bring to the table. He's not interested. Let's move on, and we'll read uh, verse 18 and 19 from chapter 2. It says, Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with the growth that is from God. How cool is that it ties in with last week? Obviously it ties in. It's the same letter from Paul. Have you ever had a conversation with someone? I was thinking about some people who've shared this with me. Um, with someone who talks about how they have heard the Lord speak to them. Or how they have had a dream or a vision. And then X, Y, Z. Sure. And then they use these experiences and their feelings to affirm the lie that they told themselves that these are evidences of their relationship with God. Because that's what they do. God speaks to me. Therefore, I am chosen. It gets worse. Um, oh, okay, let me not get ahead of myself. I want you to think about people like that. People who, who um, I spoke with someone who... Um, is, is really honestly convinced in their heart that they're a believer, refuses to read scripture, has acknowledged that they won't submit themselves to the Lord, but she's convinced that she's a believer because one day, 20 or so years ago, she had a vision of Jesus Christ standing next to her. So I politely said to her, well, um, how did you know it was Jesus? I mean, do you have a reference? I mean, let, let's... You know, because, and, I, and I'm saying this to you not to ridicule a person. I'm saying this to you to give you tools. I, I think what we do is we immediately get sucked into, oh my gosh, what's the spiritual verse for this thing? No, wait, wait, just stand back and ask a practical question. Like, where, how do you know it was Jesus? Like, who affirmed that? If you know anything in Scripture, you know that people need to affirm what you said you saw. Secondly, where in Scripture does it say that you're going to be getting visions now? post Jesus' death and resurrections? It says no way. So that's not biblical. So then you need to ask a person that kind of thing. And that is my question. Where in Scripture does it say that you are required to have these feelings and experiences to be a believer? Where does it say that? Furthermore, where in Scripture does it say that these feelings and experiences are proof that you are saved? Nowhere is the answer. Nowhere. It doesn't say any of this anywhere in the Bible. Even in the Old Testament, when prophets were given visions, um, they were always for the purpose of the glory of God. It was always for a message. It wasn't to elevate these people. It was so that people would know that this dude is sent from the Lord for them. The guy doesn't walk around going, oh my gosh, I'm so amazing. Today I have a word from the Lord for you. And so I just want you to know that I'm like next level Christian. Okay. Therefore, since God does not say this in his word, that we do not need experiences or feelings to validate our faith or as proof of our faith. Okay. Since he does not say this in his word, then it's obviously not true. So then this poor person who has told me that they are saved because they've seen Christ, I have to in love say to her, I'm sorry, but if that is your grounds for salvation, it is not true. And you are lying to yourself. I can tell you how you can be saved. I can tell you how you can know you can be saved. We've got God's word. And we need to, we need to be able to reach out to people in love in that way and always be pointing them back to scripture because we've seen, we've seen in Colossians, we can, be take, we can be taken captive, especially if it's something that appeals to us. I have no doubt it would be lovely to see a vision of Christ. 
I think you wouldn't survive it. But I mean, who of us who are believers can't wait to see the Lord? So you can almost understand the appeal that there would be this special thing for this person, that they would have this affirmation. Because let's be honest, it's hard sometimes. It's hard to walk a road and trust the Lord who you believe you can't feel and see and touch. And sometimes we want something tangible. I understand. I understand the desire to embrace the lie. But it is a kindness to reach out to people like that. It is a kindness to point them in gentleness and truth to the word. Okay? That is love. Right. So, um, mysticism, uh, if we go back to the word, if we go back to uh, verses 18 and 19, um, it says, no, I lie, yes, 18 and 19, let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels. Now, let me explain something to you. All of this stuff, all of the spirituality stuff, okay, the common word for it would be mysticism, okay? And it may be defined as the pursuit of a deeper or higher subjective religious experience. It is the belief that spiritual reality is achieved apart from the human intellect. And, and that lady who told me about her vision has just proven that. There was no clear reasoning and thought behind that. It was subjective. It was personal. There was nobody there to verify. There was nobody with her experience. That immediately makes me go, mm, were you taking a substance maybe? That wouldn't be kind. Um, this spirituality looks for truth internally, weighing feelings my intuition, and other internal sensations. It weighs those internal sensations more heavily than objective, observable, external data. Okay. It derives its authority, that's the other thing, we'll get there, from a self-actualized and self-authenticated light rising from within. And this is MacArthur's explanation. By the way, when I did question that lady on her vision, she became extremely aggressive. How dare you? Who are you to say that I'm not saved? Who are you to say that I did not see Christ? You were not there. I know what I know. I saw what I saw. I felt what I felt. I can only give her scripture. And you might have been faced with that as well. Sometimes we're faced, I, I don't know if we all have someone like that in our families or something like that, but very much, and you know what authority you do have? You have God's word, okay? That is who you are. When you are engaging in these conversations, in gentleness and truth, your authority to question is God's word, okay? Mysticism, let's quickly talk about that, where he says here, um, it's that part in verse 18, where it says, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. Um, mysticism, it's very interesting. Have you noticed that people like that, it always focuses on the individual as being set apart for having the special ability to attain a higher spiritual status than anybody else who claims to be a Christian. I don't know if you've had conversations with people like that. Oh, well, you know, I speak with the Lord. I have a vision. I'm able to call upon the Holy Spirit and get him to do my bidding. Have you noticed that the, the object of that is the person themselves? So mysticism is something that glorifies the person. It's all about them. It's very interesting. If we're all mud, and we all come from the same pool of mud, how is it that any one of us can claim that we're special mud or different mud? If God has come to save all of us who are sinners, and it's only Christ who makes us righteous, then if, if Rahab is a sinner like me from the same pool of sinners, how is Rahab a special sinner, a set-apart sinner? Why would God only give Rahab that, but not me, or Cabello, or Anne? That doesn't make sense. So mysticism, when somebody is coming to you with their extra special spiritual talents that they claim to have. Understand 
that they're not interested in God's glory. They're interested in their own. And their mysticism uh, is to elevate themselves. Okay. Um, it essentially says, I'm chosen. I'm special. I'm more special than you. I'm more righteous or even more holy than you because I see visions or I speak in tongues. I hear the voice of the Lord, etc., etc. In fact, it is only in our physical death that we experience any kind of glory. We'll get glorified bodies, so on and so forth. While we are alive on this earth, we are not glorified in any way. We, as human beings, are not glorified. The glory belongs to God and His Son. He is jealous over His glory for His Son. Okay. Christ did not die on the cross so that we could become super little gods and elevate ourselves amongst others. That's nonsense. Right. Let's go back to the verse. Asceticism. Uh, in verse 18, it says, Let no one disqualify you insisting on asceticism. So asceticism is also known as, depending on your Bible version, self-abasement. Self-abasement, and the word of asceticism or self-abasement translates into some super unpronounceable Greek word, which ultimately means humility. Okay? The problem, though, in the issue of Coloss Colossae is that their humility here, I like how MacArthur calls them the Colossian errorists. <laughs> I love that. Um, it's false humility. It's the kind of humility that one delights in. Um, and I was thinking about how to give an example of that. Um, and obviously, the moment you think you have humility, you don't. Um, when you are delighting in how humble you are, you're not humble. That's the bottom line. And so I was thinking really very hard on trying to find a example of false humility. But I have known the song since my youth, and it's called <laughs> It's Hard to Be Humble by Mac Davis. And you guys are probably going to curse me because I'm going to sing it a little bit, just the first slide. It goes, Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. And then he goes on and he goes on and he says, I can't wait to look in the mirror because I get better looking each day. To know me is to love me. I must be a hell of a man. Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble, but I'm doing the best that I can. Wow. So, um, I don't know if that guy was serious. I pray for him that he wasn't because <laughs> the rest of the song is even worse. It just gets even worse. And I'm like, okay, I'm not going to quote that part. All right. So false humility uh, in all seriousness is when you are, when you are um, paying attention to how much you sacrifice or let go or, you know, um, yeah, I guess. And then you just don't take credit for it, but you, you want to make sure. Maybe an example I was asking Amanda earlier, maybe it's like, you know, have you ever been in conversation with a person who goes, well, I guess, you know, m if my opinion doesn't really count for anything, then it's fine. I, I don't need to say anything. You find people like that will go, no, 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 of course, no, of course your opinion. That, that seems to me like false humility. It's almost like you're fishing for someone to affirm you. Um, you're not really believing that your opinion doesn't need to be of any value. Okay, so I don't know if you can come up with better examples. I was hitting a blank. Right, then Paul talks about worshipping angels. Um, that's interesting. Apparently this was quite a big problem in Colossae and the surrounding areas that people had introduced worshipping angels. And I just want to be straight with you. Worshipping angels is sin. Straight up. I'll tell you why it's a sin. Because there is only one mediator between God and men, and that is Jesus Christ. So to worship angels, or let's take it a little bit further and poke the bear, worshiping a saint or the mother of Jesus, that is sin. Okay, there is only one mediator, and that is Christ. Right. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, he says, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. In Matthew 4, verse 10, it says, Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. 
In Revelation 22, verse 8 and 9, John says, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Okay, I'm not going to say anything more on that. It's clear as day. Worship God. Don't worship anybody else or anything else. So, let's look back at the text. What must you do then instead? And what is it that such persons do not do? What those persons do not do, in verse 19, it says, and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body uh, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. That is what you must do. People who practice or insist on asceticism and mysticism and worshiping of angels, they're not holding on to the head. They are not being nourished and knit together with fellow believers. Okay? They're not growing with growth that is from God. Okay. I remember last week we spoke about being a root and being rooted in Christ and being impossible to pull out and getting all our nourishment and all our growth and our establishment. Remember, we talk about being established in Christ. Paul affirms this again. Those people who are insisting on anything other than Christ, anything other than true doctrine, which is the gospel, they are not holding fast to the head. And you'll be surprised. Don't assume that it's always from the world. Don't assume that. All of Scripture is telling us about how there are people from within. Don't assume John MacArthur, our pastors have also preached, don't assume that only Christians fill churches. That's silly. I saw a quote today about Satan, <laughs> who is never going to be coming as this, like, obvious, scary dude who we all want to avoid. He's going to be coming as your close friend, as your confidant, as that person who looks like you and talks like you and walks like you and lives like you. Okay. I'm not saying, please, I'm not saying look at one another and be like, hmm. Cabello smiled weird. I wonder if she worships angels. No, you will see that in a person's life. You will see it. The scripture talks about how uh, the Holy Spirit within us will, we will begin to bear fruit, obviously. Okay. I'm just saying, don't be surprised. And I think that's what, what uh, really levels some of us Christians sometimes is we are like, we're shocked. We're surprised that it's from within us. Okay. And that's why we need to be nourishing and growing together and holding fast to the head and being knit together and exhorting one another. Okay. Because soon then, those people will fall away. Okay. So, how beautiful and encouraging is it, God's word, that we can be nourished and knit together, that we don't have to go this road alone. So, knowing all of this then, knowing all that we've learned now, being reminded again of the complete and perfect work of Christ for our salvation, the free gift from God. The question remains, and Paul asks it in verse 20, and 20, 20 to 22. He says, If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, remember those basic one, two, threes, those ABCs, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. He's like, dudes, why? Why are you doing this? You're alive now. You are no longer alive in the world. You are dead to the world. You died, and then you were made alive with Christ. You now have Christ. All of those other things fall away. Why are you going back to that? What for? You have something better now. I've given you steak according to your preference with your favorite side, and you want to go back to cornflakes. I don't know. I love cornflakes, but I'm just saying, I guess steak would be a better option. And Paul's like, seriously, why? Why are you doing that? What for? Do you notice that all of these things have human precepts and regulations, and that they all die as they are used? How interesting. So the point is that all of our external practices, all of these rules and regulations are about things that are temporal. They're temporary. It's temporary. Are we honestly 
going to peg our eternity on temporary things. Mm, that, again, it just seems really foolish. What is not temporary? Who is not temporary? Who is everlasting? Christ. Christ's work is everlasting. Why do you want to go back to the temporary stuff? That doesn't even make sense. So, Christ is everlasting. Our salvation in Him is everlasting. And that is the crux of this whole thing. Paul affirms this in Romans 8, verse, verses uh, 38 to 39. Our salvation in Christ is everlasting. Listen. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing is the collective term. Nothing. So if Christ has died for you and you have been raised with him, then nothing None of those rituals, food regulations, observations, none of that is going to do anything for you. It can't separate you from him and it can't add anything to it. So what then does scripture tell us is the truth about these things that are not Christ? What does scripture say about rituals and asceticism and worshiping angels and ecumenicism and anything that regards Christ plus, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Let's read the last verse in Colossians 2. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. They have no value. They look really wise. Let's be honest. You know, um, a lot of these self-made religions... People think they're next level people. They just think they're better than you. They think, you know, if I'm not doing this or if I am doing that, then I must be a better person than you. That's nonsense. They've got no value. It's all external. All of it's external, right? It says it's got no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Now, that's an interesting observation, okay? Because then that means that we practice them, but at some point in time, we're going to go back to the indulgence of the flesh, right? Right? So then why are they of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh? It's a question I hope you all have the answer to, but I'm going to give it anyway. Because unless your heart is changed, the desires of your flesh will not be changed. The desires of your flesh, even though you change them for a while, are not sustainable. There will be no lasting change. None. It can't. Um... I'll give you an example from my personal life. It so happened that Mike and I met, and uh, in that time, he, he came to salvation. The Lord saved him, and within that time, we, we got married. And from the time that we met to the time that we got married, and within that time, was nine months. So it was very quick. It was very, very quick. And his transformation was radical. Mike had been a man who was part of the Freemasons. He had been a man who indulged in uh, social drinking, smoking, um, and all the other things that go with that kind of lifestyle, okay? And his sons had been raised by such a man. And when he came to salvation, and we happened to get married as well in that time, and he happened to meet me, it was a very difficult pill for his kids to swallow because they were convinced that it was me that I had changed him. But the truth of the fact remains that there is no such thing. There is no love on this earth from a human being that's ever going to cause and sustain lasting change in anyone else. Only Christ can make a new heart and sustain that. And praise God that this year we'll be married for 20 years. <laughs> I'm hoping that his sons can see now that that change has got nothing to do with me. There's no ways. I, I mean, I don't even have the energy to sustain my own change, let alone somebody else's. Um, and we can see just the fact that Mike has not reverted back to that, that that change is real and living, that he has Christ in him. And, and that is what I wanted to, so, to show you. Um, I found a beautiful quote yesterday in preparing for this lesson by C.S. Lewis. He said, I cannot, by direct moral effort, 
give myself new motives. After the first few steps in the Christian life, we realize that everything which really needs to be done in our souls can be done only by God. That's incredible. That's wise. That's wise to acknowledge that by our own direct moral effort, we are never going to be able to give ourselves new motives. Okay. So the transformation and increase of the desires of our hearts over time is most certainly the work of the Holy Spirit, right? But we also have an essential role to play. We can't just be like, I'm infused, and so now osmosis, and woo, one day I'm going to be awesome. What I mean is you don't get better at playing an instrument by praying super hard and scrunching your eyes while you concentrate your brain, and then your fingers receive the skill. Trust me, it doesn't work that way. You've got to also put in the time and effort. You've got to practice. Go and find some sheet music. Go and ask a person who knows how to play music to teach you something. But as you practice and you put in the time and the effort and you seek the Lord, He is faithful to grow you. And it is exactly the same with our spiritual walk. So the more we desire the Lord, the more He makes us desire Him. The more we desire to learn and to do His will, the more He causes us to desire to learn and do His will and learn and do it. It's a wonderful, think of it like a spiral, upwards and upwards, because all of Scripture points to Christ as the light and the life of a Christian grows brighter and brighter until full day light. It's all motivated and it's all sustained by God, all of it. He starts it in us. He made us alive. So now we're alive, zip. And we're only sustained by God who can sustain that life. And then we must now respond to that life and he gives us more and now we respond to it and he gives us more and now we respond to it and so on and so forth. Okay. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 and 27, the Lord says this to the Israelites. He says, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. If the Lord has said that of the Israelites, his chosen people, how much more is it true of those of us who have died with Christ and been raised with him? He, he will give us the new heart. He will remove the old heart. He will put his spirit in us. He will cause us to walk. Isn't that so cool? It's so cool. And since he has done that with them, then he'll do it with us. And we also see in Philippians 2, verse 12 and 13, he says, therefore, my beloved, uh, that's Paul, sorry. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, Work out, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It is God who works in you. Okay. That's why all of those worldly nonsense, all those external things are never going to change your flesh. It's a renewed heart, a heart in Christ that, that changes your flesh. Okay, so in closing... How then do we see to it that no one takes us captive? How do we see to it that no one passes judgment on us and let no one disqualify us? Along with the precious Holy Spirit of God, what tool or weapon do we have? Let me tell you. It's no secret. The Bible. Which is really cool. Because Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. We have the living word of God. That is how we do not get taken captive. That is how we let no one pass judgment on us. That is how we let no one disqualify us. Because we know God, we know what his word says, and we believe him. I really want to read this excerpt by Roger Uderian, or Uderian in this book, Through Gates of Splendor. If there's a book you guys want to read that's nonfiction, do yourself a favor. He says, he was going through a very difficult time in his ministry. 
He was really, really struggling with depression, and he didn't know the Lord's will for him, and he was feeling absolutely useless and, and just at a loose end. Okay, He didn't know what God wanted from him, but he says this. He says, My mind was made only to love him, my body also, which includes my tongue in all its activities. How slow some of us are to learn. But I will be led and taught of the Holy Spirit. God desires full development, use, and activity of our faculties. The Holy Spirit can and will guide me in direct proportion to the time and effort I will expend to know and do the will of God. Let me read that again. The Holy Spirit can and will guide me in direct proportion to the time and effort I will expend to know and do the will of God. I must read the Bible to know God's will. At every point, I will obey and do. Read the Bible. Read your Bibles. Don't ask your friend's opinion. Don't get another book about what the Bible says. Read the Bible. Those things are not bad. Friend's opinions, walking a road with one another, external books are not bad. None of it's bad, okay? Unless it's, of course, contradicting Scripture. Read God's Word. Make a habit of it. Make it become every day of your life if you can. Whenever you've got a chance. I'm going to be so bold, and I hope I don't offend anyone. But I know that there's lots of moms here. And I know that sometimes a mom's only free time happens to be on the loo, okay? I don't see anywhere in Scripture where it says you're not allowed to read Scripture on the loo. I'm dead serious. If in all things, we must do all things to the glory of God, then even being on the loo, if that is your only time of five minutes, take your Bible, go with you, and go and read it there. I'm not even a mom, and sometimes the loo is the only time I have at that point in time. Do whatever you can, wherever you can. Read the Bible. Pray to the Lord. He's made it obvious for you. He's given you everything you need for success. Okay. So, we must incessantly, persistently, diligently, and without ceasing, pray to the Lord and read His Word. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your Word. You are too good to us, Lord. Amen.